Hi, everybody. How are you? Quiet. Simmer down. Shh. It's okay. It's really not that interesting. I'm not just standing here so you can listen to me. That's okay. Wow, that was good. I'm so rude. Um, so, hi, everybody. Uh, some people came up to me during the break, and several people have asked me this question. Uh, one of the key things to growth hacking is, how to, is cycle time. How quickly can you learn? Because your one um, competitive advantage against larger players is your ability to iterate more quickly. You're not constrained by rules. You don't have as much to worry about. Um, and so I want to tell you a couple of stories. I mentioned the idea of Uber and how Uber was able to uh, develop its business by getting in a car and driving around w with its target customer and asking questions. They could literally pay someone $30 to listen to the pitch. That's actually about cycle time. They can get out and they can try their pitch each day and they can improve it and see if it works. Uh, ben, my co-author, um, was part of a company called Go Instant that got bought by Salesforce for $76 million after 11 months with 12 employees. He is the smart one. Um, and Ben left Go, uh, Go Instant. He left Salesforce, leaving millions of dollars on the table to go to a new startup none of you have heard of called Virage Sale. That's Garage Sale with a V. And they're doing so well, they don't need to tell anybody. They just open up in a market and everybody uses them. Um, it's like a garage sale on Facebook. So you want to sell some stuff through your, the best way to sell things is through friends, right? Everybody's like, hey, I've got this thing for sale. Why not turn that into a product? On the weekend, Ben can go buy something. He wants to test his idea. He goes and buys five things on Virage Sale, and then he sells them again. He can test his idea and his product with real people every single day for almost nothing. So think about what that means. If you're building your startup, one of the key success factors is how quickly, what's your, what, what improves your cycle time. What can you do about the design of your product or service that allows you to have a faster cycle time? It allows you to test your ideas and learn quickly. And we talked earlier about this idea of if you get people to prepay for your subscription, then you don't find out for a year whether you've won or lost. Whereas if you ask them in two weeks, hey, would you like to cancel, you learn stuff faster. So a key factor for all of these companies is what is your cycle time and how quickly can you change it? And when you're designing your product or service, I am more likely to be excited about your product or service if you figured out a way to quickly validate or repudiate your product ideas um, in a very quick, iterative way. All right, um, building your business model. So we talked earlier about um, your business model as these systems diagrams where you show users coming in, how they flow through the system, how you do acquisition, activation, and so on. Uh, most people, I said, look, can you just tell me what your product does? A lemonade stand is pretty simple, right? Like I'm gonna sell lemonade for more money than it costs me, and I'm going to keep some profit, and my mom's going to give me some cups. Um, that's a really simple model. And, and people who have an over-ended business model, that's a warning sign that they haven't really found what people are paying for. So they're like, well, it'll make some money from advertising, and then there'll be some subscriptions, and there'll be one-time users, and you can pay for extra storage, but you might get a credit if you tell someone else. And there's a freemium model where each month you recommend someone. You, no. No, no, no. Your business model should be as simple as a lemonade stand. You should be able to explain it. And one way to figure this out is to start with a customer journey. So this is the kind of jobs to be done design thinking. If you said, here's the morning routine, and I wake up in the morning, and at the end of it, I start the work day. So what happens in my morning routine? What are all the jobs I need to achieve? I gotta brush my teeth, take the kids to school, whatever else. All the jobs I need to achieve between when I wake up and when I start the work day and think about how those jobs have changed over time. And that's typically saying something like, what is the main job to be done? What's the core thing I'm supposed to do? And then below that, what are the functional aspects of that job? What things need to happen at a functional level? What, what tasks actually need to be performed? And then what are the emotional aspects of that thing? And there's personal emotional stuff, and then there's the emotions of those other people around you, and so on. And then there are the related jobs to be done. And if you build this model, and this is, if you go and look at like the jobs to be done technique, it's usually building a model like this. It says, what is the main job to be done? I get, get myself to work. Okay. What are the functional aspects? That Well, I've got to be in my car, I've got to drive effectively, and so on. What are the emotional aspects? I'm fed up of being in the car, I have to pick up people in the carpool, that makes me feel awkward. What are the related jobs? I better get dressed, I've got to park somewhere, and so on. And you break this down into these jobs, and then you ask yourself, like, what is changing that changes the answers to jobs to be done? So if I have a self-driving car, can I now wet shave in my car while I'm driving to work? As a bad example, I do not advise to anyone. Um, <laughs> But this is where, um, yeah, I love the fact that it's actually a straight edge razor, right? So really dangerous. Um, but this is um, figuring out what the product or services business model is. Here are the jobs to be done. Here's the functional diagram that shows how I'll make money out of it. You guys know what they call a product or a service that doesn't have a business model? It's called a hobby. So um, when you are sitting around trying to figure out your startup, if you don't have a business model, you're like, we'll figure it out later, 
That's great. I like your hobby. I'm glad you were able to find you know, your parents' trust fund or some gullible investor to give you enough money to work on your hobby. But if you don't have a business model, it's okay to be a charity, it's okay to have a hobby. Don't tell me you're gonna make it up in quantity later if there isn't a way for people to make money off you. Yes, there are some unicorns out there like Instagram which have no real business model but get acquired for lots of money. It's very unlikely you're one of them, I wouldn't bet on it. I mean, you can call me from your yacht and yell at me if I'm wrong, but it's very, very unlikely. So what is your business model? And I don't mean business plan. Business plan is like financials and projections and SWOT. It's all these things that an investor will ask you for. As I said earlier, asking for a business plan before you know your product is like asking Columbus for a world map before he leaves Spain. You need to come up with a business model, which is people will do this thing, they will perform this job in return for this money, and I will extract that money and I'll use some of it to acquire more people, and the thing will sustain itself. We do not spend enough time as startups thinking about our business model or thinking about our go-to-market and customer acquisition strategy. We spend way too much time thinking about which buttons we should use and what color they should be and where they should be located and what our landing page should look like and what our Twitter candle should be. And we should be spending much more time on other things. The companies that fail are the ones that focus on the wrong things. The ones that succeed are the ones that have a business plan, they're the ones that, uh, or a business model, I mean. They're the ones that think about customer acquisition and recognize that attention is the riskiest thing. Let's talk about the staff for your company. So um, there are a few things I care a lot about in companies. Dave McClure, who he of Pirate Metrics fame, said um, that every startup needs to have a hacker, a hustler, and a designer. Uh, I would agree, but I think there's actually one missing. Um, and many of these slides have like uh, URLs that you'll get if you hit the slide deck from your and team. Uh, but uh, there are po blog posts written about most of these topics that go into much more detail. Uh, so in a startup environment, the hacker is the person who find makes it real but they're not an engineer. An engineer makes it real, a hacker makes it real using a lazy angle, right? It's somebody who finds that shortcut. They build on top of a framework instead of starting everything from scratch. An engineer can fix that later, but a hacker, their job is to build you the thing that will let you learn, not the final product. The hustler builds buzz, finds deals, gets customers, often has domain expertise in a particular industry. The designer is the, is the person who compels or delights or engages, not just designing the UX, but designing what is the tagline on the email that goes out? Uh, what is the um, tone that we take with people? Do we use uh, conjunctions or full sentences? There's a lot of stuff that goes into the experience you're trying to build. And the analyst tracks growth and keeps you honest. So I think Dave forgot the analyst as a fourth growth. And I don't mean you need to have four employees to start the company, but I mean you need to be able to put on these four hats. Companies that don't have these four roles, whether they're played by one person or several people, tend not to do well. You can promise something, but you can't build it. You can build it, but it looks terrible. You can launch it, but you have no idea whether it's successful. So you have to have these four hats. Some people I know even go as far as to say, today is my hacker day, today is my designer day, today is my um, hustler day, today is my analyst day. You have to be thinking about those four roles to succeed. Um, something else I learned, and I learned this about myself, is there are three kinds of CEO. Uh, there's a product CEO. I am a product CEO. I know this of myself. I mitigate it, but I'm a product CEO. Product CEO says, if the product is awesome, everything will work out. If I could just get that missing feature, everything will be fine. We're wrong. A sales CEO says, we just need customers. They'll tell us what to build. Let's go sign things up. It doesn't matter what they want. They'll tell us what features we need. They're wrong. And a finance CEO says, if we can just get the model right, the business will run itself. Let me show you my 75-page spreadsheet with functions and macros. All of these people are wrong. The reality is which you need to know which one you are, and then you need to find really good partners to do the other two. So the first thing I do if I start a company is find a really good sales CEO and a really good finance CEO, or a really good uh, sales, VP of sales, really good uh, uh, CFO. But if you don't know which one it is, these are all true together, but they're wrong individually. It's easy to tell which one a founder is six months into the company. Because there's one thing they talk more about, they brag about, and the other two are ailing, and they try to sweep it under the rug. Our product is awesome. Why don't you have engagement? We just have this one more feature, and then we're going to turn on the fire hose, right? Or our business model is awesome. Why aren't your numbers doing that? Well, we're working there, and they're trending upwards, but we haven't quite got there yet. But let me show you how when this hits, this thing will trigger the what? Or a sales CEO. We have 75 customers. What are you selling them? 75 different products. Is that a problem? No, it's easy. It's engineering will take care of it. Another thing that I've learned about um, the Valley is um, these four letters, T, Y, and Y, T. These are the four letters that run Silicon Valley. And most people I know who've been to Silicon Valley and come back and like, looked all confused and wondered what just happened, this is why. 
Um, the first thing is um, the five minute favor. Hang on a second, I'm gonna change this. I think I made a typo. I wouldn't wanna subject you to that. Oh no, that's right. Okay, I'm gonna change this order. There we go. So um, the first thing is, um, <coughs> are you there? Uh, YT is like, hey, are you there? When I ask someone, are you there? And they reply on I am, yes I am. Oh, you should come work for a new company. What? Okay, I'll see you next week. The number of hires and recruits that happen this way in Silicon Valley mystifies everyone. Like I have 10 friends that I know and I'd love to work with, and if any of them called me or I called them, and they were like, hey, you need to come talk to me in this new company, I'd be there tomorrow. I'd get on a plane, I'd go do it. And recruiters have no idea about these underground networks. They're entirely based on reputation and all that other stuff. But those, those two letters, YT, drive all of your ability to hire the right talent. And this comes down to social capital, it comes down to connections. But if I can fire up a chat and go, hey, you there? Yes, I am. You should come work here. Okay. Recruiting is like, we just lost our CTO. I have no idea why. So the first thing is the churn that happens in the Valley is almost entirely based on back channel. Recruiting doesn't really work. It's all word of mouth. It's all somebody knows a guy. It's all somebody had breakfast at Bucks in Woodside and all of a sudden they went to a new place. The part that's really mystifying is the five minute favor. So does everybody here know what the prisoner's dilemma is? Prisoner's dilemma is a famous example of game theory. Uh, let's say Yarun and I are arrested for robbing a bank, but they can't prove anything. But they did see us driving away really fast, and they're going to charge us with driving really fast, which has a year-long sentence, as opposed to robbing a bank, which has a 10-year sentence. So they take us into separate rooms, and they say, Yarun, you're going to jail. But if you rat out Alistair, we'll let you go. If you don't rat out Alistair, we're going to send you to jail for one year. They take me aside, they go, Alistair, you're going to jail. If you rat out your own, you can go, we'll go, you'll go free. If you don't rat them out, we're gonna give you a, ten, uh, you're, we're gonna give you a one year sentence for driving fast. So both of us have a choice, right? We can either rat out or not rat out. However, what will always happen is I will rat out your own and he will rat me out. And we're going to jail for 10 years each, which is a total of 20 years. So if you look at this system, the system has three possible outcomes. One year and one year for a total of two years. 10 years and no year, or 10 years and no year for a total of 10 years or 10 years and 10 years for a total of 20 years. The best outcome for the system is that neither of us rats the other out and the system as a whole experiences two years of time in jail. But what this guy, Nash, actually the guy he's playing, Nash, uh, realized in a beautiful mind is something called the Nash equilibrium. And it has to do with game theory and how, how people work when they're presented with these kinds of dilemmas. And in the assumption that you and I will never work again together, and it's a one-time engagement, I will always rat him out because the economically rational thing for me to do is I should probably rat him out because I either get zero or 10 years and I gotta go for zero. I'm not gonna get the one because he's gonna rat me out because I'd rat him out because he's gonna rat me out because I'd rat him out and it keeps going like that and that's called an Ash equilibrium. It's very depressing, humans suck. The reality is it's not like that if you hope to commit another crime. If the two of us wanna get out and rob another bank, then we stay quiet for a year, we go to jail and we come out and we rob another bank and we don't drive so fast. Um, <laughs> however, Silicon Valley behaves according to a prisoner's dilemma. Let's say that instead of going to jail, Yarun and I want to um, help one another. You would really like to meet um, Stephen Harper, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister of Canada. I would really like to meet some Dutch royalty. Now I could work for two months and finally get an audience with a king or queen. Yarun can work for two days and get me that. He can call the Canadian consulate and get a meeting with Stephen Harper in two months, or I can do it in two days. I don't know Stephen Harper, I'm just making that up. But the system we have here is either four days work or four months work. The more efficient thing is the four days work. For Jeroen, he does me the five minute favor, I do, me, I do him the five minute favor, the system is efficient. But Nash Equilibrium tells us that he's gonna claim to do it, I'll do him the favor and he'll leave me, leave me hanging. And in the same way, I'll claim to do him the favor, so neither of us will do it, we'll both tell the other we do, and we hate each other, right? That's how things normally play out. So there has to be punishment in the system if you don't do what you say. And it turns out that as soon as you take a prisoner's dilemma and you introduce pu punishment for non-compliance with what you said you'd do, the system automatically corrects to a new equilibrium where people help one another. So we have a system where People can do something in five minutes that would take someone else two months and help them out and reciprocate, and the system as a whole becomes more efficient. There's one other problem. I don't know who Yarun knows. 
So he's got to walk around going, I know how to reach the king and queen. I know how to reach the king and queen. I got to walk around going, I know how to reach Stephen Harper. Fast forward to Silicon Valley. Everybody goes to parties and acts like a complete jerk bragging about who they know. And if someone screws them over, they gossip to everybody. <laughs> this looks like horrible behavior. It's actually social systems that produce the most efficient outcomes for the most people. This behavior that you see on like the Silicon Valley TV show, you're like, oh my God, these people are idiots. No, they're not. They're maximizing the outcome of a, of a prisoner's dilemma. They're generating a new Nash equilibrium. They're all bragging about who they know. Basically, they're advertising routes to their resources that they can get to efficiently. And if someone doesn't reciprocate, they're telling everybody because I got to punish people so that everybody is aware of the punishment happening and therefore doesn't screw them over. So what you get is incredible amount of gossip and incredible amount of bragging, which looks awful, but actually maximizes the outcomes of the valley more than any other uh, network in the world. It's really sad, but that's why Silicon Valley is so successful. So the reason I put this in the list of how not to fail is if you don't understand this behavior and you go to Silicon Valley, it looks awful. First of all, you're like, everybody's a jerk. <laughs> they're all bragging all the time. They're all gossiping all the time. Second of all, you may have one or two favors and if you don't follow through on them, you're screwed. <laughs> and people are usually like, there's another thing about the system, which is you should offer to do the first favor for free because you want to bring more people into the system, but then they want to reciprocate. So a lot of people will offer to help you. And you're like, everyone wanted to help me, but if you don't understand the contract that's going on, you're not aware of that interaction. So this is a very strange dynamic that happens in social systems. It happens in, in a lot of environments where you're trying to maximize the outcome of a system. Um, you may have heard of the tragedy of the commons. It's the same idea that you have this shared resource and the, everybody wastes the shared resource until you introduce punishment and then the resource gets better managed. It's the same kind of thing about these resources. So what you're doing is uh, this idea of a five minute favor leads to this incredible bragging at meetings and gossip that's actually just game theory in action. Sorry, it's really depressing, but that's how it works. Uh, some stuff you need to know about advisors and boards. Uh, ask yourself, first of all, why do you have your advisors? You have your advisors uh, to help your company. And a lot of people are like, oh, I got this advisory board. Why? What are they there for? Everybody has got advisors. They need to earn their keep. You can fire advisors. You need to make the expectations explicit. I expect you to introduce me to a customer a month. I expect you to review my financials and find weaknesses in them. I expect you to tell me how my competitors are doing. I expect you to introduce me to five VCs during a fundraising round. If you haven't set that, you wouldn't hire someone without giving them a job description. Why do you have advisors without giving them a job description? Manage your advisory board. They're not there to make you look nice. They're there to do something. If they're there to make you look nice, great. Tell them to write articles about you or pose in front of cameras. I don't know. But they need to earn their keep. Give them options. Don't give them shares. Give them options. Those options should vest over several years with a one-year cliff. So if you show up and you do work, you will earn those options. I can fire you at any time. If you give options to your advisors and they leave, your cap table gets messy. It's harder to get acquired. If you say, I'm going to give up options to my advisors, they earn 1 48th or 1 24th of their option each month, but they don't get any until six months. Then if you have to fire them after a couple of months, you don't mess up your cap table. Options are good incentives. Give them a lot, give them options. When you talk to investors, you'll find that investors are sociopaths. When you have a board meeting, I have investors like yell at me and hug me in the same meeting. It's because of this. An investor has their own investors. Investors have what are called limited partners who put money into a VC fund and they try to use that money and allocate it wisely. Investors are sociopaths because they're trying to decide whether you're a rock star or the living dead. At every meeting, if you're the rock, they, they invest in 10 companies, one of them is going to do well, nine will be dead. They want to know, are you the one that does well or the nine will be dead? If you're one of the nine that will be dead, they want to kill you right now, take your money and give it to the rock star. If you're the rock star, they want to celebrate you and give you all their money. But they don't know what you are. So they're constantly waffling between you, the rock star or the zombie. They have no idea. So they look like sociopaths because their bosses are like, you better put double down on the one that's good. So any little tiny cue they can find in a business for which they're not the expert, they're constantly trying to figure out which one you are. A couple of other things. Um, marketing is not a bad word. Uh, I talked earlier about Sergio Zyman, this idea of doing more things, which is like increasing inventory or gifting to more people, making it viral or low incremental costs, for more money, which is maximizing shopping carts, uh, more often, which is getting a loyal customer base that keeps returning, and more efficiency. And when you are looking at growth hacking, you will find that your growth problem is probably a marketing problem because growth is out of your control. 
product design, within your control. Even hiring and firing, within your control. Growth, probably out of your control. It's based on the opinions of others, which sucks. So I'm gonna talk to you about something called a message map. <coughs> and I'll end with this. This is a really useful tool I found. And this is how I like to go work, when I'm working with customers, um, this is how I like to think about uh, building uh, marketing messages. So a message map is, I'll do this in a marketing campaign, I think. So a message map is basically understanding how to get your customer from an initial, hey, it's anyone in the world, down to someone who bought my product. And a lot of times, startups have a hard time crossing the chasm, if you've read the Jeffrey Moore book. Um, so let's say, for example, that I am trying to, s I'm Honda, and I'd like to sell you a Honda hybrid car. And the first thing I say, there's everyone in the world, of which there's a segment called people who need a car. And then, of the people who need a car, there are some who are willing to buy it. Of the people who are willing to buy it, some will buy a hybrid. Of the people who buy a hybrid, some will buy a Honda Civic. So, at the first thing, in the, I need a car, there's a group of people who want to drive, right? They need a car, they want to drive. They should buy a car, they're prospective car buyers. It should be a hybrid, they're people looking for a hybrid. It should, buy a, it should be a Honda Civic, there's Honda Civic hybrid owners. Um, this group over here basically is saying something like, I need a vehicle to get around, be productive, and enjoy my life. The second group is saying, I want to own a car, not just have a vehicle, have access to one like a car sharing service, I want to own a car, because it's, a per it's convenient, it's a personal relationship, and I don't trust others. People smell, whatever. Um, people looking for a hybrid, I want to save money in fuel, I care about the environment, and I want to be seen as a green person. And then people who own Honda Civics. And then if I look at these, right, the campaign I might run for the first group is, isn't it time you got out of the city? Some campaign showing how cars make nature accessible and ridiculing urban hipsters for, for walking everywhere. Um, down here at the second one, I might run an ad showing how cars are needed at urgent times, like pregnancy, urgent business, how a car is your personal assistant, you shouldn't trust other people with that vehicle, you might need it at any time. My campaign down here might be um, urgency, like every time you drive a non-hybrid car, you kill the planet just a little bit more, or um, people, buyers who've saved money on their, on their gas. And down here, I might say Honda branding, Honda-specific models, and so on. You'll notice that the campaign I run up there is very, very different from this campaign. There's no point in telling that person isn't Honda great if they're not gonna wanna buy a car or drive a car. Now, um, down here, I might, for Honda Civic owners, I might do a follow-up satisfaction campaign to see if they're working. But looking at this thing, there are people who don't fall into this funnel. So the people who say, I need a car, there's those who don't need cars. I'm too young to drive, I'm too old to drive, I can walk or take public transit. Uh, there's those who are car users that won't buy. The car's too expensive, I'm just gonna use a shared service, my car will get stolen. Uh, there's those who won't buy hybrids. Eh, hybrids are gutless. The batteries are toxic and explosive. In the end, it costs more than it saves. And then there's people who buy another brand. I buy domestic. I've always driven a Volkswagen. Toyotas are reliable. I want something prestigious. These are the objections, right? What we're doing is forming a map of the mindset of our target market. So for this thing, I then say, um, what might the campaign be? I'm too young to drive. Great, Honda, sponsor a driving school. I'm too old to drive. Run a campaign called Give the Gift to Dri of Driving to Target Grandparents. I can walk or take public transit. Public relations on the dangers of commuting and pedestrian deaths. <laughs> um, car users who won't buy. I'm gonna do financing and cash back. I'm gonna sell to car sharing services or I'm gonna underscore their limitations. Uh, I'm gonna do theft warranty tracking services or high-end locks. Uh, for hybrids that are gutless, independent tests of standard metrics, lab research and studies, ROI calculators, battery replacement programs. Down here, I'm gonna prove that Honda hires US workers to deal with the objection of buying domestic. Time to leave Germany ads. Spontaneous acceleration <laughs> stories about Toyota uh, or you know, a premium brand like Acura. And so what you see from this, if I put all this together, is that you've got a, a pretty significant um, map of the mind of a customer from everyone in the world down to someone who bought your product. Most startups spend a lot of time on this. When you've crossed the chasm and you've actually made it to the point where you're a big, serious vendor, you think about this whole ecosystem. And the target campaign up there at the top may be entirely different from the one down here. So as you get more sophisticated, as you get into the scale stage of growth, you need to start thinking about your marketing message map like this. this. This actually build this out. What are the key decision points or inflection points or criteria that someone has to go through between being an anonymous person and someone who actually has bought your product already? And then come up with all of the tactical marketing activities over on the right to move them through that funnel. One last thing on marketing campaigns. So, um, 
one, I get a lot of people asking me if I'd help them with their marketing campaigns, especially PR and, and marketing communication stuff. And I ask them like three questions and they usually go, thanks, thanks Alistair, we're done, we can go now. Um, the first question I ask them is, who are you targeting? I wanna know who is your target market, what is the size of that market, how reachable is that market, how is the market homogeneous? So it better be big enough, a better way to get to it, and the people within that market better have the same set of needs. There's something about them that makes it different from others that I can target. Okay, you've told me your market. Um, tell me what you want them to do. A lot of times people don't have an answer. There's a specific measurable call to action. And then, that's great that you want to do that. Why on earth should they do it? Um, my favorite quote from a salesperson I worked with is that people do things because they want to get laid, made, paid, or afraid. Laid means sexy. Hey, look at me, I got this cool new toy. I have an Apple Watch, right? Um, Paid is I got money. Made is I have referent power in the organization. I have leverage over you. And afraid is like, I'm terrified. Protect me from danger. And the message has to fit their mindset. You can't combine these. If I say I love you, but if you leave, I'll kill you. That's just creepy, right? You, you have to have one of these that's the focus of your campaign. And then you say, how will you know if they did it? Because you obviously need to learn and track this stuff. And so that's all about analytics and instrumentation. And at what point will you decide if it worked or just? This diagram is everything you need to know about marketing campaigns. Let me give you an example. I work on a lot of conferences. I've done this work for conference organizers where they say, we need help with conferences. I say, okay, who are you targeting? Well, we have three audiences. We have the people who want to speak at the conference, the sponsors. We have the attendees who want to listen to stuff. And we have bloggers who want to cover the conference. Okay, great. What do you want the speakers, uh, the sponsors to do? We want them to buy sponsorship. Okay. What do you want the attendees to do? Well, we want them to buy a ticket and we want them to tweet about it. What do you want the bloggers to do? Well, we want them to write a story. Okay, there's four campaigns, right? So there's uh, sponsors sponsoring something, there's attendees coming to the conference, attendees tweeting about it, and bloggers writing about it. Why should they do it? Sponsors should come here because, leads, sponsors should come here because, thought leadership. Why should the attendees come? Attendees should come here because it's good for their career. Should come here because they'll meet their friends. Should come here because we have really good drinks. Um, why should um, the bloggers do it? Because it'll be a lot of easy stories. Because we'll give you a really nice tote bag. So you write these on a wall and literally within a couple of minutes you have like 30 possible campaigns because you've been disciplined and structured about identifying the people, the actions you want them to take and the reasons why. Now that you've got that list of 30 possible campaigns, you go through and say, what is the metric for success? Did the blogger write a thing about us? Did the sponsor spend more than $5,000? Did the person buy a ticket? It's measurable. Um, and now I, these basically are little campaigns and I know what they are. And I'm disciplined about knowing them and measuring them to see if they work. And I'm like, okay, we're gonna run this campaign for two weeks and then we'll reevaluate if the AdWords spend is good or if uh, the, um, the emails we're sending out to sponsors are getting open and so on. Most people don't ask these questions. Who are you targeting? What do you want them to do? Why should they do it? It is amazing the number of people who say, help me with a press release. Okay, who are you targeting? Well, I don't know, I'm writing a press release. Uh, who's it for? What do you want them to do? Why should they do it? I don't know, I was told to write a press release. Stop writing press releases. Start hacking markets. Find a reason why you're doing something. This is a horrible, horrible problem. We do marketing awfully. So. Growth hacking is about, I have a behavior I want for a target market, I'm gonna give them some, I've got a thing that I think will cause them to do it in the future, I'm gonna optimize that. This is just how marketers should be thinking. And so, when people do this stuff, when they build message maps, when they take this approach to building proper marketing campaigns, when they actually think through how do you get users to do things, that's when they're starting to hack growth. Because they're understanding customer development, they're understanding the mindset of the customer, they're moving away from, will, can I do it, and they're, moving towards will anyone care? And almost always the risk in your company is will anyone care? So that's where you should be spending most of your time. I have a question, Arthur. Yes. Um, you have one big thing in the beginning which depends, all the other stuff depends on it, which is who are you targeting? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you iterate on who you want to target? Who do you want to target? So this was about building a marketing campaign. There's a yeah. process behind that that says we target this and that would be customer development and so on. You'd, you'd spend a lot, of, I'm, I'm just saying like, we have a conference now, we have a product to sell, who are we gonna target, right? Um, if you're running experiments, you would find another way to target those. So um, you might try a simple call to action like sign up for this mailing list or um, tell your friends about it or whatever, that you could, and you could try that simple call to action, not the full-fledged thing, to see can I reach different markets, how expensive is it to get to them, how many of them will actually do what I ask. Um, so you find a simpler proxy for the bigger thing you're looking to do without a full-blown campaign. 
So I'm gonna wrap up with this. Um, Lloyd Nelson famously said, the most important figures one needs for management are unknown or unknowable, but successful management must nevertheless take account of them. In other words, you're all screwed, data won't help you. Um, but I'm gonna tell you a story about Archimedes. So Archimedes um, was a famous scientist in the Greek era, and um, he did a bunch of work for this king, and one day the king said, hey Archie, he called him Archie, hey Archie, I, uh, I have this crown, and I think someone ripped me off, because it feels kind of light. I gave the guy some gold, he made me a crown, but it's an irregularly shaped crown. It's not a cube or a sphere, so I can't really measure its volume. So I don't know the density, so I don't know if I got ripped off or not. And Archimedes was like, ah, let me check, kingy. Because uh, maybe it was an alloy, the guy made it bigger, it weighed the same, but it was actually, it wasn't dense, so the guy melted down some, some, uh, uh, some silver and made it bigger, but it's half silver and he wouldn't know. And so Archimedes went home to think about this in the bath. And he climbed in the bath and the bath water went up and he went, oh, Eureka, I've got it. Displacement of water in the bath allows me to measure an irregularly shaped solid like Archimedes or a crown. That's not actually what happened. He actually had a whole measuring apparatus and so on. But the story has him running naked through the street going Eureka, which is much more funny. And it turns out that the guy did indeed fake the crown and the king beheaded him. It's not a nice story. None of that is my point. My point is that Archimedes had taken baths before. Um, he had been in the bath, Greeks loved their baths, but he never had a question. And once the question was there, the answers were all around him. Once that question of how do you measure an irregularly shaped solid was there, the answers, he literally was sitting in the answers. The problem is not a lack of information. We have way too much information. The problem is a lack of good questions. Once upon a time, a leader was somebody who convinced others to act in the absence of data. Today, a leader is the person who knows what questions to ask. So the hardest part, whenever we sign these books, we always sign, ask great questions. The hardest part is asking the right question. Once you know the right question to ask, thinking subversively, being disciplined about attention, knowing where your biggest risks are, once you ask the right question, the answers are all around you. We've never lived in an era where there's so much information available abundantly for free. It's just a matter of asking the right questions. It's the hardest thing to do. It's also the reason why you deserve the money if you're successful as an entrepreneur, you deserve to fail if you're not, is because you did or didn't ask the right questions. Once you ask the right questions, the answers are all around you. So if you have any questions for me, um, I'm the one at the bottom that's, that's not as smart as Ben, but I'm acroll at gmail.com or at acroll. And I think you want to do some Q&A stuff now if you've got a few questions? Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you.